There's a dance that's in your chair You've given us the bed Now we're stirring up the head Bring the rain Good morning guys, how are we doing? Are we good? I've had a bit of a morning getting here, if I'm brutally honest I've had a, a bit of a struggle this week actually In the last two weeks last night I've been preparing this message and you know, I really believe that God doesn't want me here. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> and uh, that was confirmed when my son Elijah, five minutes before the service started, yeah. fell, and yeah. it looks like he's potentially broken his arm. Can you believe that? I know. But you know, we're believing for healing, aren't we, Elijah? Yes. And he wants to stay because he wanted to hear me. He's now lovely. Bless him. Um, and I know this sounds really bad. Um, don't take this wrong, Elijah. I had to kind of stop myself from laughing. Uh, not because, not because you hurt yourself, but because I just kind of felt like it's like typical, you know? Like the enemy really doesn't want me here, the enemy really wants to distract me, and, and I really believe that because I feel like I have a word for you this yeah. morning. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, I've actually had this um, word stirring in my heart for the last five years, believe it or not. Um, and I was at our old church in Newquay, and it was one of our prayer and fasting weeks. And um, I can remember being on my knees and I was surrendering again, I surrendered a few times. And I really found the Lord just stir this message on my heart. So I got my iPhone out and I started um, just writing down everything the Lord was um, you know, stirring me. And I can remember about an hour later, I sat on the chair and I was reading through everything. And uh, insecurities quickly flooded, as they do, and so I deleted it. And do you know I didn't even tell Tim it? Probably because I knew if I did, he would make me do it. Uh, so that was mine and God's little secret until now. And do you know, looking back, I can see why I didn't bring it. You know, this um, has been something the Lord has been working on me so much in this area, and it's, it's really only been the last few years that I've received my biggest breakthrough in this. And you know, it's something that I'm confident that most people in this place would have struggled with. And I'm still struggling with today. And you know, it's, it's an area that I am so sure the Lord wants restored in our lives. So we're going to be looking at identity if you haven't already guessed it. And you know, I know this sounds quite extreme when I say what I'm about to say, but... <laughs> everyone, my friends, my closest friends, they know how much I have struggled with identity in comparison throughout most of my adult lives, you know? And, I've even thought of lots and lots of ways I could try to get out this morning. Lots of ways. But you know, I'm so confident in the word that God has given me this morning because it's been my testimony. I'm confident that he wants to speak to you today. I am confident in the power of testimony because it points to Jesus and his faithfulness. You know, Revelation 12, 11 says, They have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And for those of you who are new to faith, I know there's a couple of people here. Um, when it says the blood of the Lamb, they're talking about Jesus and his blood that he shed for us on that cross. You know, he did it so we could have a relationship with him and we could have eternal life through him. And you know, his blood changed everything. That day it changed everything and it continues to change everything. And you know, the best news is that Jesus rose again on that third day and he is seated in heavenly realms and he is waiting for you to cultivate a relationship with him. Jesus, the King. Amen. You know, he's waiting for you guys to start knowing your identity and start living life in abundance. Yes. He's waiting. Yes. Amen. So, I wanted to... Um, just give you a brief outline of um, my background and you know, I think it's important that you kind of get a, an idea of my background and just how the subtleness of the enemy can creep in and feed lies into your life which will ultimately direct your life. So a brief outline, I'm keeping this really um, brief. When I first wrote this I had two A4 like pages so you'll be pleased to know I have cut a lot of this out. So my mum and dad separated when I was a baby um, I was kind of passed from two to four. Um, I think it's fair to say I had quite a dysfunctional upbringing, um, like most of you of us here, I'm sure. Um, but it really did contribute to identity issues growing up. So I met T when I was 17, 
some of you will know the story of how we got together, some of you won't. Uh, for those of you who don't know the story, all you need to know is Tiva uh, was desperate. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually lying, it wasn't Tiva. It was me. I was desperate, but we're not going to go into that this morning. Uh, so, I'm sure you'll find out. Uh, so he started to invite me to church, um, where a few months later I found Jesus. And yeah, I would have said I was Christian. I, I was christened uh, when I was a baby, and my grandma was such an influential part of my life, and she used to tell me stories of the Bible. So I would have said I knew God, uh, but I didn't, and, and I didn't know Jesus, and I didn't know the Holy Spirit. And she died when I was 12, and as, you know, my mum was an atheist, so that's pretty much as, as far as my spiritual input went. Uh, so as soon as I made a commitment, Tiva started to stop coming to church. And you know, my, my roots really weren't deep enough. So I soon followed, and we had about a period of two years where we just got sucked into the world. We, uh, New Key's got a big, well it did have a big drug scene and party scene and we just got sucked straight into that and basically we turned our back on Jesus. And um, two years on from that, Tiva had a pretty serious motorbike crash in Bali. Some of you would have heard his testimony, I won't go through all of it. But he was basically coming out of a club and he was drunk, got on, got on his motorbike to go home, he was going at some speed and he fell off. And he actually had a baseball cap on. And as he was like sliding like at some speed on the road, this baseball cap was protecting his face. And we still actually got it. It's completely scratched down to its bones, and that would have been his face. And um, he ended up in a ditch. <coughs> Bali is kind of the roads aren't really finished. So he ended up in this massive ditch, and his arm was hanging this way. This arm was open to its bone. And he really felt the Lord clearly tell him, the road you are leading on is leading to spiritual and physical death. And, you know, it was a wake-up call for us. We knew that we had to re recommit our lives to Jesus. We knew that we had to start, um, you know, plugging into church life and just serving where we could. And, you know, looking back, I was so young in the Lord. And I spent years of my life comparing my spiritual walk with Tivo and the people around me. You know, I wasted so many years comparing myself. And Tiva, he was brought up in a Christian home. You know, he had years on me, you know, spiritually, yet I'd still compare myself to him. You know, I'd see how he heard from God. You know, how he spent his time with God. How he used to pray to God. How he used to remember these scriptures. And instead of being inspired and encouraged, you know, because of my insecurities and my brokenness, I would just feel more and more like a rubbish Christian. So because of that, I used to hide behind him, you know, I'd let him do the talking, like, especially in Christian circles, because in my mind, you know, I'd probably say something wrong, so it's best to say nothing at all. And, um, you know, it even took me years to pray out loud, and it's still an area that I have to really push myself in, because again, you know, in, in my mind, my friends were so eloquent when they prayed, and, you know, they would memorize scripture after scripture, and they would sound so holy. And, and, and for me, I'd be so nervous. You know, before I used to pray, I used to rehearse what I was going to say in my head. Anyone else done that? You know, just to make sure it sounds really good. So I would be so nervous, I'd be, I'd be rehearsing the prayer before I said it, so I knew that I had it down. And by the time I'd go to, you know, pluck up the courage to, to, to pray, you know, the moment had been gone, and someone else has prayed what I prayed probably, and, and again, I just convinced myself that it's best I said nothing anyway. And I really had no idea who I was in Jesus. And I allowed years of lies that are spoken over me to take root and to fester, and I came in agreement with them. You know, it's only really been the last few years that I've begun to understand who I am in Jesus. And I love Psalm 139. I love it. And verse 13 in particular, it says, You made all the delicate inner parts of my body, and you knit me together in my mother's womb. I actually want to encourage you um, this week to read the whole of Psalm 139. It's beautiful. It's, it's really long, so we can't for time's sake this morning. But you know, it really is a beautiful example of how well Jesus knows us. He created us. 
You know, he, he made all the delicate inner parts of my body. He knit me together in my mother's womb. You know, that's how well he knows me. He didn't make a mistake when he made me. You know, he hasn't made a mistake when he's made you. And Satan, he wants us to come, um, you know, he, wants, he doesn't want us to know who we are in Jesus. He doesn't. You know, we live in a broken world of broken people, and people are going to say hurtful things all the time, and Satan wants us to come in agreement with the lies spoken over us. Because if we have no idea of who we are in Christ, and that power that lives inside of us, you know, this is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead. That's Ephesians 1.19. If we have no idea of that power that lives inside of us, we are powerless. We won't know who we are. We won't have authority in situations that will come our way. And what sort of example are we going to be to people around us that don't know Jesus? You know, the truth is, is we won't be an example. You know, to God, we are the aroma of Christ. 2 Corinthians 2.14 says, But thanks be to God who always leads us as captives in Christ's triumphal procession and uses us to spread the aroma of the knowledge of him everywhere. <coughs> and therefore we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. And you know, uh, Paul wrote this in a time when the Roman armies, armies they were conquering nations. And it was in their custom, when they conquered a nation, they would take some of the captives um, that they caught and they would lead them through the city in procession. And they did this because, you know, they wanted to display that Rome was in power and these people, these captives were seen as trophies of victory. You know, so this is the picture which is behind the phrase, God always leads us in triumphal procession in Christ. You know, we, we could say that God parades us around as his trophies of victory. It's amazing. You know, we should be the evidence of the power of God which is able to take a person um, and free them from the grip of sin and death and free them to be a person that belongs to God. You know, we should be that evidence. You know, being that aroma which is being an example to the people around us. Um... A few years ago now, I was just about to sing at, um, it was our first Labesh evening. Um, for those of you who don't know what Labesh is, it's, it's just a night of worship, it's a night of encounter, just enjoying God, and um, we kind of let the Holy Spirit um, take the lead, they're great nights. And I was just about to sing it, I was really nervous, um, you know, I felt pressure to learn the new songs that we had learned, I felt pressure to be, um, you know, hearing from the Lord and singing spontaneous songs. And a guy called Christian, who started the best year of Tiva, he read out a quote from Alan Scott. And some of you would have actually heard Tiva um, use this quote before. And the quote is, When you know who you are and what you carry, nothing is impossible and nowhere is off limits. That's a good quote. I'm going to read it again, so I really want it to go in. So when you know who you are and what you carry, nothing is impossible and nowhere is off limits. You know, this quote just stayed with me. You know, things just really get you deep and I was thinking of it like over and over again. And I soon realised that, you know, I didn't know fully who I was. And I didn't fully know what I carried. And because of that, things were impossible in my mind. You know, so easily I would disqualify with most things spiritual, you know, without hesitation. You know, so easily I would say, oh no, that's, that's not my gifting. Oh no, 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 that's not my calling. You know, so easily. And it's actually one of the reasons why I'm standing here. I was asked to do a short word in a new key or old church game. And you know, that straight away the answer was no, no, no way. I'm not doing that. that that's not my calling. And I think I can remember saying I would never do that. Emphasise on the never. Yeah, probably best you don't say that to God. <laughs> you know, I can also remember being asked to do the notices. This was years ago. And you know, I was so 
scared, I felt physically sick. Like I can remember crying to Chief because I didn't want to do it. You know, in my mind, people didn't want to hear me. That, that wasn't my gift, and that was Tiva's thing. That wasn't my thing. But I'm so happy that I did it. And you know, Tiva, throughout my years, he has pushed me in areas where, at the time, I've, I've been mad at. You know, I was, I was angry at. But I'm so glad that he was there, and he has pushed me and encouraged me in love. Um, because it would have been yet again another area of my life that I would have allowed the enemy foothold in. You know, there's been multiple times that Tiva has pushed me in areas. You know, he's, he's spoken truth. And there's been uncomfortable at times. But you know, we are called to speak truth. You know, we're called to speak truth in our friend's life, and sometimes it's going to be uncomfortable. Sometimes it might even be hurtful, but that is what we are called to do. And, you know, I think it's so important that we've got these people in the body around us, and it's important that we do the same. You know, Proverbs 27, 17 <coughs> says, As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. You know, we're supposed to speak truth. So I've been reading Exodus uh, recently, and I just want to read a few things that's really stood out and encouraged me. I know this sounds really bad, but I do find it quite encouraging when you read of great men and women in the Bible who have these, you know, amazing encounters with God and amazing encounters with Jesus, yet they still mess up. Yet they still get things wrong. You know, it makes me feel better when I mess up. So, a brief outline of Moses and his beginning years for those of you who, who don't know. So Moses was born into a slave family in Egypt. His life was immediately threatened when Pharaoh ordered all of the Hebrew male infants to be drowned at the Nile. So he did this because he saw that the Hebrews, they were slaves, they were growing in numbers. So he was scared that they would grow up and that they would want to fight him and they would want to leave. Uh, so Moses' mother, he, uh, she hid him uh, for three months, but she was eventually um, forced to um, put him in a basket um, and set the drift where he was found um, by Pharaoh's daughter, and she adopted him into Egyptian royalty. So fast forward, when Moses was 40 years old, uh, Moses was angered when he saw one of his Egyptians being violent towards uh, his enslaved Hebrews. So he killed him. And he hid the Egyptian's body in the sand. And the next day, when he realised that Pharaoh knew what he had done, he was scared for his life. So he fled uh, into the wilderness. He met, on, uh, he met a priest, married his daughter, and then went on to have two sons. So I think it's fair to say that he had no intention of returning. So that brings us up to date to Exodus 3. Uh, and it's the burning bush. So we're going to read from chapter 3. I believe Tiva's has got a little... Um, so that you can follow that. Oh, it's there. Oh, uh, for those of you who want to open your Bibles, open your Bibles to Exodus 3. So it is quite long, so please keep up. We're going to dip in and dip out. So just uh, follow my lead there. So, Moses and the burning bush. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that the bush was on fire, but it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight. Why the bush does not burn up? And when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, Here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And at this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. And the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down, and I, have res I want to rescue them from the hands of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land. A land flown with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing me. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. So I'm just going to stop there for a moment. Can you even begin?
begin to imagine what Moses was feeling. You know, he just escaped from Pharaoh. He was in hiding, probably quite content with his new way of life. And, and here he was, minding his own business, where he saw this burning bush, which was clearly on fire, but not actually burning, where he heard the audible God call his name, not once, but twice. And then God then going on to say that he is going to be the one to lead the enslaved Israelites out of Egypt. I think it's fair to say what he was thinking. I think he was probably having a little freak out. I think anyone would. And, uh, you know, Moses goes on, not once or twice, but five times, pleading with God, even begging God to change his mind. So verse 11, Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And then God said, I will be with you, and this will be a sign to you that it is I who has sent you. When I have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. And then Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the Lord, the God of your fathers, has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? And then God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am who sent me to you. And then God also said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name you shall call me from generation to generation. And then God then goes on um, again through verse 16 to 22 to um, basically tell Moses what to say to the Israelites. But we're going to skip that because of time. So we're going to pick up a chapter 4. <coughs> So then Moses answered, What if they do not believe in me or listen to me and say, The Lord did not appear to you? And the Lord said to him, What is in your hand? A staff, he replied. So the Lord said, Throw it on the ground. So Moses threw it on the ground and it became a snake and he ran from it. And the Lord said to him, Reach out your hand and take it by the tail. So Moses reached out, took the snake, and it turned back into a staff in his hand. This said the Lord, is so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. And then God goes on uh, to demonstrate another two uh, demonstrations of power, if one wasn't enough. Um, but again, we're going to skip that three. So that's three massive demonstrations of power. Verse 10, Moses said to the Lord, pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been eloquent, neither in the past, nor since you have spoken to your servant. I'm slow of speech and a tongue. And then the Lord said to him, Who gave human beings a mouth? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight? Who makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak and I will teach you what to say. But Moses said, Pardon your servant, Lord, please send someone else. I just wanted to just go back on verse 11 really, because I just want to touch on it because I feel it's kind of a bit of an elephant in the room. Um, and I know I probably won't do this justice with the time that I've got this morning, but you know, it's my personal belief that um, that is not the character of God. I do not believe that God makes the blind blind or the mute mute. You know, that's not the good God I know. The new King James actually version, it says, The Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Who makes the mute, the deaf, the seen, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? I know this... This implies that God makes the person, you know, the mute, the deaf, the seen, or the blind, not the disability, but the person. And, you know, I believe it's sin that has entered the world, which has led to broken humanity, which contributes to disability, to illnesses. You know, not God. And that's why Jesus came down. He came down to deal with sin. You know, he came down, he opened blind eyes. You know, deaf ears, he made the mute speak. And Colossians 1.15 says, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Yeah. Yeah. Hebrews 1.3 says, he is the exact representation of his being. Yeah. You know, that is why I don't feel like that's the nature of God. Uh, apologies if that's not enough detail for some of you this morning. Uh, I really don't have enough time to go into it um, any further, but I did feel like I needed to address it. So... Going back to Moses, verse 12. Now go, I will help you speak and I will teach you what to say. But Moses said, pardon your servant, Lord, please 
send someone else. You know, even after all that Moses saw and heard, you know, it wasn't enough for him to trust God. And he pleads with God, send someone else. So in the end, God sends someone else. He sends his brother Aaron to him to be his tongue. You know, how often do we just tell from God's calling because of our insecurities? You know, I have done it time and time again. But at the end of the day, if we don't do something that God has called us to do, he's just going to get someone else to do it. I actually had um, a situation recently um, where the lead, Lord clearly told me to do something. Right? It was very clear. Um, it doesn't happen often, but it was very clear. And it was actually something that was over social media. I'm not going to tell you what it is. Uh, because um, I basically didn't do it. I didn't want to do it. It was completely out of my comfort zone. So I felt scared. I just didn't want to do it. So I didn't. And I found out about a week later that he has told someone else to do the exact same thing that he told me. That exact. Like so much so, if I now did it, it looked like I'm just copying this other person. And I feel like there's a lesson in there. You know, I don't want to miss out on God's calling that he has for my life. You know, I don't want to miss out on the fullness he has. But the reality is, it doesn't end with me. And it doesn't end with you. If he calls me to do something and I don't do it, he will just get someone else to do it. And you know, in Moses' case, the Lord is full of grace and he went on with the help of his brother. He led the Israelites out of slavery and into freedom. But I wonder, you know, if Moses responded to God's calling straight away, if he knew who he was, if he trusted in the Lord's clear covering, you know, it was clear, it was so clear. You know, I wonder how much smoother, how much quicker that whole process would have been for him. You know, when I was first going through this story, I just thought it was crazy. You know, after all that Moses saw, you know, this burning bush, God called his name twice, the audible two-way conversation with God, and these demonstrations of power, they, they still want enough for Moses to trust God. And I can remember saying to God, I was like, Lord, if that was me, you know, if I, if I saw what Moses saw, if I heard what Moses said, I'd have, been, I'd, I'd have trusted you, I'd have been gone, I'd have been off to Pharaoh. <laughs> but you know, he dropped in my spirit countless times, and you know, countless times where he has come through in situations that could only have been God. You know, like, it was so clear, it was God's covering. Yet two months later, you know, two years, two, two days later, I had forgotten and I was left in that same place, not trusting him. You know, true identity, it's only found in intimacy in that secret place. And you know, Moses, he went on to have such an intimate relationship with God. You know, he encountered him. Matthew 22, 38, it's the greatest commandment. Jesus declared, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. You know, this is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. But you know, if you don't pursue God, you know, with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all of your soul, if you don't spend that, that, that time, you know, learning who he is, and I'm not just talking a set time in the morning, you know, or a set time in the morning and a set time in the evening, you know, I'm talking all day, every day, everything you do. I know this has been a journey that I've been on, I've, I, I'm, I'm probably not there yet, but, but that is what I, I want, I want to bring him into my all day, every day. But you know, if you don't do that, how are you going to love him and in return understand his love for you? And then how are you going to love your neighbour as you love yourself? Because if you don't truly know his love for you, you can't truly love yourself and then he won't be able to love your neighbour. You know, you will always see fault in yourself. You will, you will never see yourself as Jesus sees you. You know, a son... 
daughter redeemed, totally blameless. You know, that's how, that's how Jesus sees you. <coughs> Romans 10, 17 says, So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. You know, the Bible is full of identity and purpose. It's full of it. And if, if you're in this place it's not today and you are struggling in this area, read his word, declare his truth over you. Romans 10, 17, as I just said, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. You know, for years, uh, Tiva and I have been in a season of speaking declarations over our family. Yeah. You know, okay. Physically speaking yeah. them out. And they have gone deep. Yeah. And so often we will find ourselves in situations and, you know, these scriptures will come and it's God's truth. And, you know, I can speak them out and I can have authority in those situations. But they didn't just come. They weren't, they weren't just there. You know, I had to put um, time in. It, it came through discipline. It came from encountering. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is alive and powerful. It's sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit and between joint and marrow. There's power in his word. I would love to stand here and say that I have you know, got this 100% sorted, that I am free from my insecurities in comparison, but I'm not. I'm keeping it real, it's one of our core values here at the Agent House. You know, I'm not yet there. But you know, my focus isn't going to be on the situations that I find myself in. My focus is going to be on Jesus. Now, I'm going to seek first King Jesus, Matthew 6. Uh, 33 I think it says, it says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all of these things will be given to you as well. You know, for me this has been something that I have journeyed through and you know there has been beauty in the process. But I also have seen firsthand God completely set people free in an instant. You know, he's done it with me personally. Um, I had as I mentioned earlier, two years of my life where I was addicted to um, party drugs, um, ecstasy, cocaine, MDMA, weed, antidepressants. And it got so bad that I was doing cocaine at 4pm just to get me through the day. And when Tima had his crash and we knew that we had to get our life back on track with Jesus, I can remember crying out to God. <laughs> And I was just like, I, I, I could not see anything more in front of me. I could not see how I could get myself out of this life. How I, didn't, I don't even know if I wanted to, really. I don't know. It was a crutch. Yeah. But you know, the Lord instantly removed all desire, all want, everything in an instant. So, you know, I, I know that God can break things in an instant. I also know there's beauty in the process. So, you know, if you're in this place today and you are struggling in this area, I know he can remove it. And I'm, I'm going to sing a song that I've written. And I wrote this one one of my biggest breakthroughs in this area. I'm keeping it real, again. Okay? Uh, I kind of feel completely out of my comfort zone. I'm not a pianist. Um, and the song is really raw. But you know, I am being <coughs> obedient to what I feel God has told me to do. And I'm not going to miss this one. <laughs> so when I finished, I've got some handouts here of who God says you are. Yes, thank you. And you know which truth? It's God's word, it is truth. And can I encourage you, if you are here this morning and you know you want freedom in this area. Come and get one. Pick it up. You know, speak it out daily. Start knowing your authority. Start knowing your identity. And start living out that reality of being that sweet smell and aroma of Christ. But you've got to move. That's your choice. So I'm going to end on that quote from Alan Scott. And then I'm going to play this song that I've written. 
When you know who you are and what you carry, nothing is impossible and nowhere is off limits.
your feelings that way. Come forward and take these out. As I said earlier, speak them out daily. You know, start knowing who you are. Stirring up ahead